Hey, welcome to the Aramir Roundtable. Today is the 20th of February, 2019, and our guest is Felix Bertram from Tour Trader. So welcome, Felix. Uh, I've seen you in Trading Group uh, one a couple times, and nice to have you on the roundtable today. Well, thanks a lot, Tom, for having me. Uh, and hello, everybody. Welcome to my presentation, How to Code Option Strategies with Turing Trader. Yeah, and I'll, I'll uh, mute myself, I'll put myself in the background, I'll still be here, but if I see any questions, I'll bring them to your attention, and um, yeah, uh, welcome, and uh, off you go. Awesome, wonderful, thanks, Tom. Okay. So let's uh, jump right in and have a look at the agenda. So I want to start with a brief summary of my background. Uh, then I want to show you how to install Touring Trader and set up your data. And we want to implement uh, the parking trade, which most people here in the group hopefully are familiar with. And then we want to run the strategy and create some reports. And we want to finish with um, doing some slight modifications to the strategy to improve it a little bit and to optimize it. So uh, let's start with my personal background. My name is Felix Bertram. I have an engineering background, so I have a Master of Science in Electrical Engineering and have more than 25 years experience in product engineering and software development. I also have a business background, so I have an MBA and I'm somewhat of a serial entrepreneur, so I'm on my fourth company right now. Um, and I have more than seven years experience in quantitative trading and analysis. And my current company is Bertrand Solution, and we offer three things there. One is financial advice, one is mentoring, and training, one is research and development. And uh, this presentation probably falls into the mentoring and training category, which brings me to the disclaimer. Uh, so the information provided here is for informational purposes only. This is not financial advice, and if you need financial advice, please consult with a professional. And uh, performance data is uh, past performance, which is not indicative of future results. Trading is risky and you might lose money in doing so. So that brings us to installing Turing Trader. Um, there's some prerequisites before you even start. And what you need is a development environment. And what I'm using here is a Visual Studio and the Community Edition 2017 is just fine. So this tool comes for free. And then we need visualization. So uh, what Turing Trader does not have, unlike most other tools, is a graphical front end. And so for visualization, um, I use Excel, which is uh, the recommended uh, method of doing that. If you don't have Excel, um, then you could use R. And if you use R, please use it with R Markdown. It also works without, but it's getting less and less exciting. Um, and then, of course, you need the Turing Trader source code, and there's multiple options how to do that, and we'll look into that in a minute. Uh, the one note that I want to make here, please do this as a Git repository, and not as just an archive, a zip archive or something like that. And you need some quote data. So, um, and then there's something else that you probably want, and uh, this book is actually highly recommended. Uh, this is not a tutorial on C Sharp, it is actually a reference, but a reference with very detailed explanations, and you should have that on your bookshelf, and uh, I have it myself, and I, I circle back to it on a, a regular basis, even though I've been uh, coding C Sharp for several years now. So let's have a look at the source repository. So uh, you go to www.touringtrader.org and you click on the repository button and that brings you to Bitbucket. Bitbucket is a service uh, just like GitHub that is used to host um, source repositories. And here there's multiple ways to download the code. So there's a download button on the left that you see there. Don't use that. Go to source and there's this little arrow and then check it out. And um, so you really want to check it out using a Git client. And the advantages of that are that now your copy of code that you have is connected to the repository so that you can actually take advantage from all the changes that I make. Turing traders under active development and there's uh, new features and bug fixes and stuff going on pretty much every single day. And you, you want to stay connected with that and be able to update um, the Turing trader version that you're working with on a regular basis. 
And what you need for that is a Git client, and the client that I'm using that is also free is source tree. And when you have source tree, it will look somewhat like this. And what you can see here is an endless list of commits. Every commit is a change that I have published. And uh, these are organized in branches. So there's a development branch, which is where I make all my uh, regular development on. And then there's the master branch, which is a little more stable and which is something that I use in production. And uh, this is not just for you. For me, this is also for you. So you can create your own branches when you have new ideas and want to experiment with it. And I'm not sure how this works out. And what you can do here is you can go back in time and review the changes. So it kind of keeps history for you so that you know what you've changed. And you can also roll back in case you find, hey, this is no longer working. I was at this change. And uh, what's also uh, important is you can merge changes between branches, which is when you do that manually, a very tedious and error prone activity. So it's highly recommended uh, when you want to do serious software development, be serious about revision control as well. Good. So that brings us to the quotes. And um, quotes are at the core of any backtest. And the important thing to Keep in mind, here's garbage in, garbage out. So do yourself a favor and get the best quotes uh, that you can find. Now, the next question that, of course, comes up is, can I get data for free? And yes, you can, but uh, you get what you pay for. And I've seen issues with free quotes. Um, so there's often missing quotes. Uh, there's glitchy quotes. Uh, there's issues with the way uh, prices are adjusted. Uh, if you still want to do this, um, for equities and indices, Turin Trader can download data from Yahoo and from Stuck. Uh, when it comes to options, there is actually no historical free data available, but you can get live updates, live data from yahoo.com or from interactive brokers. And Turin Trader has another feature built in that is uh, simulated fake data. And uh, these data are based on SPX and VIX and give you at least an idea how things work. They obviously can't reflect the market, but uh, they can be still very useful to learn and experiment and get your feet wet. And we um, get to those a little later. So when it comes to paid data, what do I use? What I do, uh, do I recommend? Well, there's uh, for Norgate, which I use for equities and indices. And for options, I buy my historical data from the SIBO data shop. And for live data, or to update these data, I go with a broker, interactive brokers, that is in my case. So now let's look at the data model real quick. Somewhere in the... Uh, installer folder, you will find uh, a folder data. And in there, you find a bunch of INF files. And um, Tool Trader has uh, in the important concept of a data source and an instrument. A data source has a nickname, and all these INF files have um, carry the name, of, which is the nickname. And then there's an instrument. An instrument is what you ultimately trade. And there's the one-to-many relationship between a data source and an instrument. And you can see that here for the options, for example, where there's only one data source called SPX options, but that will explode into a, a, something on the order of 50,000 option contracts, which are the instruments. Um, Inside this folder, this data folder with the IMF files, there's another data folder. And inside there are a bunch of folders uh, with the nicknames. And inside those, uh, there's a CSV files with quotes. And um, when you go back here, you see that I don't have that many folders here. That's because I use Norgate data. I can get to the advantage of that in a second. And for SPX options, for example, well, you will have um, one CSV file per day or is it compressed uh, CSV files, so zip for each day. So this is several thousand files there. And um, now let's have a look at um, how these INF files are created. So I use Norgate for most of my stuff. And Norgate comes with a little tool that's called Norgate Data Updater. And uh, what this tool does, it updates and maintains the local database. So you have nothing to do with it if there's price adjustments and splits and dividends and takes care of all the stuff that needs to be adjusted. So that's good. Um, and Turin Trader can connect directly to the Norgate database. So there's no additional files involved. So you don't need to export from there or something like that. It connects directly. And now on the top left here, 
you see the content of the SPX index.inf file. And uh, you can see that there's only very little information required. You need to specify that you want to get these data from Norgate, and you need to specify the symbol, and you see that uh, the symbol is different inside Turing Trader. It's a carrot SPX, and Norgate prefers to have a dollar sign there. And then you need to give it a proper name, which is S&P 500. So when you go on with a CSV files that you pulled from Yahoo or whatever, this looks a little different. Um, so you will have a local CSV file somewhere, and you need to specify the column mapping for that. And Turing Trader can now update uh, or append to these CSV files. And you see that uh, for the column mapping here on the top, there's a little more information in the INF files. So they have fields for open, high, low, close, and which column in the CSV file you find them in, and what the format of those are. And at the bottom, you see the symbol mapping, and they're specified that this is going to be updated using Yahoo. And um, th now that we've seen that, uh, let's see how this looks for the option data that you pull from the SIBO data shop. Um, well, you will have thousands of these um, CSV files, and there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, for options, you also need the expiration, the strike, and the write. And this is uh, this you also need to map to the proper column. So there's a few more lines in the INF file, but it's ultimately the same thing that needs to be done here. And well, as said before, Turing Trader can append live snapshots so that at least you don't need to buy data every day if you don't want to. Good. So now that we have data, um, Turing Trader is pretty much ready to go. Uh, so we can uh, run demos and we can uh, implement user-defined strategies, uh, which is what we want to do next. Um, so let's have a look at the parking trade. Um, the parking trade was developed by Tim Pearson and Dave Thomas. And I hope it's known to most people listening here today because it makes it easier to have a look at the code when you've uh, seen the strategy before, at least know what it's supposed to do. Uh, it's simple enough to be suitable for a demo so that you can, um, and it's uh, complex enough to show all the relevant uh, techniques. Um, Cool, so let's have a look at uh, the rules real quick, recap those. Um, we want to open a trade once a week, um, if we can, on a down day, and if not, no later than Wednesday. We want to sell um, spreads with a DTE of about 30 days. And uh, what we're selling is 20 or 25 point wide uh, put credit spreads. And uh, we're targeting to get about $1 of premium every time we sell. And um, we exit um, when we either can buy it back for 20 cents or when uh, we exceed $3 or pretty much on the last trading day. So it's a, it's a pretty simple thing to implement. Um, so is this a crash course in programming? No, it's not. So um, what are the goals? I want to help you hit the ground running and I want to help you get a better understanding of the methodology and be less intimidated by what it takes to uh, code a strategy like this. But at the same time, well, this is not a programming class. Uh, I guess you need a little more than 30 minutes for that. You should still read the documentation. And Turing Trader actually does come with documentation. And uh, you will still occasionally make mistakes that take you uh, some hours or some days to figure out. Uh, so you'll still take the scenic route occasionally. OK. so. The first thing that we need to do for creating new strategies, we need to add an item to the project. So we open the project, the solution it's called, uh, with uh, Visual Studio. And there's a folder in there with demos. And you right click on that, and you say add, and you say new item. And while this wasn't too hard, uh, the reason why I'm showing you that is because the dialogue that comes next, and this is the first thing where people get confused. There's so many choices, what you could add. Well, you just want to add a class. And you give the class a name, and we call it Aramo Park and Trade, and then you click Add. Um, and just ignore all the other things that you could possibly add to a project. Cool, so that brings us to a dummy algorithm. So uh, Visual Studio will have created some code for you already, and will have opened that file now. And you'll, the first thing that we need to do is we need to import the required libraries. And while there is some stuff that Visual Studio has added for you already, you still need to add a line here. That's the one in the red box. So you still need to add the library for the Turing Trader simulator so that you can actually link to that and use the features from the Turing Trader. 
And uh, it will also have created a dummy class for you, but this class is not derived from the algorithm class, so you need to change that by adding the colon and the algorithm there. And um, now we need to add uh, two methods to it. One is the run method. This is where basically all the strategy logic happens. And then the other one is the report method, which is where reports are generated. So this is now a perfectly valid um, Turing trader strategy, except that it doesn't do anything useful. But if you can compile it, and you could even uh, launch it, it just doesn't do anything. Cool, so we hide the stuff that uh, is distracting. And uh, for the next few slides, we're probably uh, spending all of our time inside the run method. So uh, let's have a look. The first thing that we need to do is we need to set the simulation range. And uh, the Turing Trader simulator has a bunch of fields that you can set for that. So you have a start time and you have an end time. And uh, these values are nothing magic. They're just, uh, they just happen to be the dates that are the date range that I happen to have um, SPX data for. And then there's the warm up start time. That is optional. You don't need to do that. Um, but um, often indicators need some time to warm up with data until they uh, create uh, valid results. And uh, this is something you want to keep in mind when you're running uh, uh, moving averages or something like that, that you need a little bit of warm up. <clears throat> and you can specify that there. And the next thing is before you can trade, you need to probably make a deposit into your account and uh, understand what your commissions are. Well, you set a little field here for your initial cash, and we set that to $1 million. Uh, the reason why we go so high is just to make sure that we have enough contracts to trade so that we can actually see what uh, the strategy is doing and are not affected that much by rounding errors. So we want to make sure that we have double-digit uh, lots later on. And uh, we make a deposit. And this is something where Turing Trader is different from other simulators. So you don't just set the initial cash. You actually make a deposit. You can make as many deposits as you want. You can also withdraw. So this allows uh, you to simulate a lot of interesting things. So you could simulate uh, savings plans, income strategies, retirement strategies, and stuff like that, which you cannot with a lot of other simulators. And the next thing is when you set the commission and we add another field here, we set that to one cent and we set the commission per share. And uh, well, it's important to point out here, commission is per share and not per contract lot. Uh, so this is basically one dollar per lot. Um, Good, so um, now let's specify our instruments. We've seen before that instruments are defined by a nickname or described by a nickname. So we set some fields with our nicknames. We need the SPX index and we want uh, the SPX option chain. And then we have two statements to just bring this in. Uh, it's important to point out here that uh, we have to add the underlying manually. Uh, without the underlying, the simulator will not know how to expire options. And uh, also, as you bring in the whole option chain with just a single uh, line of code, that is different from other simulators that don't know about options. And this is because of the one-to-many relationship. So the one data source for the weekly option can create 50,000 uh, option contracts. Good. So now that we have the data, we need to go through them. And we do that in a loop. And uh, so there's a, the for loop where we go through all the simulation times. This is, again, different from other simulators that are typically event-based, which means you, you have a method inside your strategy that is called for every bar. Uh, well, Tune Trader is different, does this in the loop. Um, if you don't like that, if you prefer the event-based uh, way of looking at things, well, you can have that. You simply call that method inside this loop. Uh, generally, this loop allows for more freedom. There's some things that you can do with this that you otherwise can't. Um, for the novice, it might be nice that uh, when you want to hold uh, stuff in variables, you can do this in a local variable inside the run method and don't need to make that a class member. And you can do more advanced things like simulations that take multiple passes to complete because you need some information from the future that you otherwise can't get. Um, those are more specialized things, but uh, it's, it's actually a pretty flexible way of handling this. And now we have a data source added, but we don't have an instrument, so we need to find our instrument. And the first instrument we need to find is our underlying. And uh, we 
add a little field here to hold the underlying instrument, and then we have this line here. Um, so the important part, oops, um, sorry, let's go back. The important part here is this find instrument statement. And um, because find instrument is an expensive operation because it needs to look in the simulator through a long list of several thousand instruments to find the right one, uh, you want to save it to a field and keep that and don't do that in every iteration again. It's just a matter of speed, so that's why we're doing it. Um, now that we have the underline, we can access quote data. And uh, we use this to normalize our um, plots a little bit so that things look a little more pretty in the end. So let's define a little field here to hold the underlying um, price on the first trading day. And here the important part is um, the one in the box where we look at the close price the latest close price. So that's what these square brackets are doing. If you have a zero in there, it's the latest. It's today's closing price. If there was a one there, it was yesterday. A five would be a week ago. And um, so you can access the time series of close prices uh, this way. And there's also a series for the highs, the lows, the opens. And uh, on the first trading day, we assign that to a variable so that we can memorize that. And um, now let's have a look at the uh, rules again. We want to sell a weekly that is approximately 30 days to expiration. So the first thing we need to know is what are the expiry dates that we have uh, in our option chain. So that's the statement. It looks kind of intimidating, so let's go through this. So the feature that we're using here is called Link, Language Integrated Query. And it is one of the coolest features that uh, C Sharp has to offer, I think. And um, what this does is it's basically a database-like way of looking at uh, data structures. And let's walk through this step by step. So the first thing that we do here is we pull the option chain. So this is basically the equivalent to the find instrument. We give it a nickname and uh, what we get in return is a long list of all the option contracts that are available for us. And now in this where statement, we're filtering out all those that are expiring on a Friday or on a Saturday. And now an instrument holds a lot of data. We ignore all that. All we're picking here is the expiry date. And we remove all the duplicate expiry dates by saying distinct, and we save that to a list. So link is really is an awesome feature. And it is a very simple way of looking through an option chain and finding what you're looking for. So you really want to read up on how that works and learn that. It's the most useful thing you can learn when you want to deal with options in C-sharp. Um, now we need to find the one that uh, has 30 days to expiration or the closest to that. And uh, that's the statement. The important word here, I guess, is approximately. And we have our list of expiry dates that, and we pick the, and what we do here is we um, calculate the difference in days, in total days between uh, the expiry date and sim time zero, which is the latest timestamp of the simulator. And uh, if uh, this is between 30 and 32, we pick it, uh, there should be only one. And if we can't find one, we use a default value. And uh, now we can, are ready to trigger uh, the opening of new positions. So we start a little new method here, which we call open parking trade. We pass it an expiry date. Uh, we're going to get to that a little later in just a minute, I guess, uh, what's inside there. And now um, we have this. So the first thing we do is we check if um, the um, expiry date that we have just picked, if that's still the default, well, then we didn't find anything. So we want to make sure that we have a proper date here. And now we look through all the positions that we have open for this expiry date. And if this list has the length of zero, then what means there is no position. And well, then we should probably open a new trade. So that's what this does. Good, and now the last thing we need to do here in the run method is we need to maintain our existing positions. So let's have a look at the rules real quick. Um, immediately after opening, we want to place a good till cancel order. Well, Turing Trader doesn't have good till cancel orders, but what it can do for you is it can check on every bar whether you needed to do something. And so we add a little method here, which we call maintain parking trade. And we, again, will pass in an expiry date of the positions that you want to maintain there. 
And then we walk through all the positions that we have and we create a list of the expiry dates that we find there. And for every expiry date, for every distinct expiry date, we call this function so that we can check if there's something that we need to do. Great. Um, so um, that brings us to the open parking trade uh, method. So what do we need to actually open a trade? Um, when we look at the rules again, uh, it says preferably after a down move or no later than Wednesday. So we probably need to check the down day somehow. And we've seen how we can access time series of data. And uh, well, so this line of code will check if today's closing price is lower than yesterday's closing price. That's probably a down day. Uh, I don't really like that definition, and I think we can be a little more creative than that. Um, what we can also do is we can have a look if today's closing price is actually lower than the three-day moving average of uh, the uh, closed prices. And that seems to have worked a little better for me. But um, the point that I'm trying to make here is when you have a set of rules and when you're coding it, you need to interpret a this a little bit and don't take it verbatim. Instead, think a little bit about how a human would actually um, execute this. Uh, Good. And now we can trigger the opening of uh, new positions. Um, so if down day is true, or if it's Wednesday, uh, then we're probably ready to do something. So this is uh, what um, this if statement does. And now we need to fill in what's in the um, curly braces. Um, so we want to open a 20 or 25 point wide put credit spread for a premium of $1. And uh, well, this, now we need to figure out how to do this. So the first thing that we do is we look at our option chain again. And um, we take the full option chain. We make sure that uh, what we're looking at is actually put. We make sure that it's got the correct expiry and that the strike price is out of the money. So this now gives us a list of candidates for, for the put contracts. And uh, well, we want to make sure that this list is as short as it can get. Uh, to gain speed because we need to basically now create a lot of combinations to find the correct one. And that is what the next statement does. Um, so we start with uh, setting some variables for our target premium and for the range of premiums that we're willing to accept. And then comes this statement. This is probably the most complex statement that we have in the whole code. So let's go through this, what this does. So the first thing uh, is the select many, and this is kind of a complicated um, operation and you really want to read up what that does. Um, I, I can try and describe it in just a few words. So for every put candidate that comes in, we're um, now bringing in a list of um, new put um, candidates, that's the other leg, um, which is 20 or 25 points away, and we flatten that list. And with that flattened list, we now have two contracts, one for the short and one for the long in our hands, and we save those two legs and we calculate the premium uh, that we would get for that. And now we have a long list with uh, hundreds of combinations, and of that list, we only take those where the premium is actually in the range uh, that we're looking for. And now we order it um, by the uh, difference to the target, and we take the one that is the closest. Um, but I'm not expecting that you can read this line immediately. Um, select many is really one of the functions where you need to see some more examples and some more text and to wrap your head around it. But uh, you can see how powerful this is that actually in a single statement, we have found uh, the, uh, the spread that we're looking for. Now that we have this spread, um, well, first we should probably check, do we have one or did we not find one? If we did not find one, well, we should bail out. Uh, one of the things as a word of warning, do not print um, while you're optimizing. Uh, that's going to be a mess and uh, it's going to slow things down significantly. And we get to what optimization is a little later. Just keep that in mind. So now, now we really do have a spread in our hand and uh, we introduce another variable here for the risk per trade and set that to 7%. That's a totally arbitrary number. And I sat down yesterday with uh, Tim Pearson and we discussed this a little bit and probably we should set it a little higher. Um, I couldn't 
change all the slides that were affected by that in the short amount of time that remained. So I kept it here. And now we calculate the risk. And when it comes to calculating the risk, again, uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. What I chose to do here is I'm taking the, uh, max, the risk based on the max, maximum theoretical loss. So I'm taking the delta between the strikes, the width, the width of the spread, and I'm subtracting the credit that I have received. But there's other ways to look at it. We're going to use a stop loss, so you could also um, calculate the risk based on the stop loss. Um, or you could just skip this code altogether and set the number of contracts to a constant number. What I'm doing here is I'm um, calculating the number of lots to trade as a constant fraction of the net asset value. So I'm multiplying the net asset value by the uh, amount uh, by the percentage that I want to risk per trade and um, divide that by the risk that a single uh, lot has and that gives me the number of contracts to trade. Good, and now we can trade um, our spread. And this is in two halves. The first half is actually submitting the trade. So you place the trade here. And the trade method returns an order object and that order object has a common field and we can set that here. Um, you really, really want to make sure that you add comments to every single uh, trade that you place because it makes it so much easier to later on analyze the trade logs and find out what went wrong or if this is really what you wanted. Good. Now that we have um, opened our trade, we need to maintain it. And for maintaining, uh, the first thing that we need to do is we need to find our legs. So um, every um, position should have two legs, a long leg and short leg, and we um, look through the positions that we have open and we check if it's an option, if it's a put, if it's got the correct expiry, and if it's going in the wrong, uh, correct direction. And we do that for both the short leg and the long leg. And uh, well, generally we should always have both legs. It's uh, better to be safe than sorry and test for that. Uh, shouldn't occur. And now we do some calculations. So let's have a look here at the rules real quick. Uh, we want to buy back um, our spread for 20 cents or for three dollars, whatever comes first. And uh, we want to close on the last trading day. So we need to calculate uh, the value of our spread and we need to calculate uh, the days to expiration. And that's what these two lines are about. And uh, now that we have that, I guess we're um, we need to specify our profit target and stop loss, and, and now we're ready to close. And the way we do this here is we set a little uh, variable with our closing message, and we set that initially to null, and we assign a message whenever we see that one of these conditions trigger. So here's the profit target and the stop loss and the days to expiration. This looks a little odd with DTE uh, less than two. This is simply because uh, the Friday that we want to close could be um, a holiday or whatever. So that's why I chose to do it this way. Uh, otherwise, it would be more code to figure out if this is really the last trading day. And now to close it, basically we check, do we have a message? Yes or no. If we have a message, we're ready to close. And while well, we just uh, submit a trade and add a comment to it here. And the comment is just the message that we have created above. Good. So that's it. Now we're ready to run. Well, actually not quite. While we have a strategy, it's not sharing the results with it. There's no output, so we need to change that. Um, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to go back to the, uh, well, we need to define a new method for us, which is this debug plot method. And we call that at the end of a simulation loop. And we should really make sure that we do that at the end of the loop because uh, we want to do this when all the trades are submitted and when everything else is calculated. And now let's have a look what we need to do with the debug plot method. So the first thing we want to do is we want to create a plotter object. And uh, this is uh, the object that we use to store all the data that we want to output. And um, now, a plotter object can hold multiple charts. And so we create a chart here and call it error in your parking trade. And uh, every chart has a common horizontal axis, the x-axis. And we set that to the current simulator timestamp. And now we can add multiple plots to that. So the net asset value and the 
drawdown and uh, the underlying. And what you see here for the net asset value and the underlying is I'm normalizing these so that they start with a value of one on uh, the left side of the plot. So that's just easier to compare things because otherwise a million versus uh, an SPX of uh, 1200 or something just doesn't look good on a chart. Um, Good, and now we also probably want a trade log. Uh, for an equity strategy, maybe not, but for an option strategy, we absolutely want to. So uh, we wait for the last bar, and this is last bar property tells us that this is the last bar of the simulator. And we create a new um, chart for that, we call that trades, and now we loop through the trade log. So two trader is keeping a log of all the trades, and we can look through that at any point in time and see what's in there, what the orders are that have been executed. And uh, we print the desired fields, and there's, there's quite a few of those. Um, just take this for granted, and we look at it uh, when we see that in the report a little later. Um, now, the last thing that we need to do is we need to wire this up. And uh, we set another variable here. And um, this string here, simple chart, that is the name of a template. And Turing Trader's output um, is template driven. So the way how things look depends on which template you're choosing. And um, simple chart is one that comes with Turing Trader, but you can create your own. And now the only thing that we need to do in the report function is we need tell the plotter to please open um, with the template that we have specified here. And uh, once we do that, um, well, we're ready to run. It's all here, and we have reports. And uh, this will probably open Excel, and it will look like this. And as you see here, uh, both SPX and our net asset value start at a value of one on the left and then progress somehow to the right. And you also see the drawdown. And I'm pretty sure that you want to make this more pretty and add more stuff to it. Well, you're um, invited to create your own templates for that. Um, Excel is cool here because it's interactive. You can easily uh, add or remove um, uh, data series here and you can uh, change the date range and filter it and do something like that and it, it'll immediately be reflected in the chart that you see there. And uh, on the second sheet, uh, this is our trade log and what you see here is the timestamp and the action and what kind of an instrument it was, which exact contract it was, the number of contracts, the fill price, and on the far right, you see our comment, uh, the open, the profit targets, and maybe some stop losses as well. And um, well, now you will say this wasn't performance-wise what I was expecting. The parking trade is supposed to do much better than that. And what's the difference? Well, there is a bunch of differences. And uh, let's go through these. And I, I had this discussion with um, Tim Pearson yesterday. Um, there's, there's a bunch of reasons why uh, this looks different. So the first is the definition of down days. And there's multiple ways to do that. You could just uh, look if the SPX is lower than yesterday, or I'm, I chose the method of looking at whether the SPX is lower than three-day moving average. You could uh, check if the VIX has an uptick. So it makes a big difference how you, exactly you make the entry. So this is worth experimenting with. The second part is the method of calculating risk. And I chose the method of basing it on theoretical risk. And probably the better way to do that is to base it on the stop loss. So instead of saying the theoretical risk varies um, with the width of the spread, well, it's probably constant because our stop loss is always the same. So it would be $3 for the stop loss minus the $1 for the credit. So the risk should be really only $2. And then, of course, it, the position size is a big question there. And uh, you, we could do this as a constant number of lots. We could do this as a constant fraction of the NAV. And the important part there is also the risk setting per trade. So I set it to 7% maximum theoretical risk per trade, which is very low, which is why the performance is lower than what you would expect. But if we were to set this to 20%, assuming that there's uh, up to 5% multiple trades, well, it would be almost three times that. So performance is not the issue there. This is not something to get wound up about. You can change that to your liking. 
Okay, and the last thing there is uh, the quotes. Um, this uh, simulation was run with daily quotes, uh, snapshots at 3.45 p.m. And that might not be uh, the best thing to do, especially when you look at the stop losses. And it might be just that there's a little uptick uh, for a few minutes and that triggers the stop loss and you have no idea in the simulation where uh, the prices are, were for the rest of the day. So expect that the performance shown here is probably a little less than what you can really achieve. Now let's have a look how the same thing would look with our markdown. And you can see the same charts get different colors, but otherwise it's the same thing. And the trade log and uh, the template that I have there for our markdown renders to HTML, so that would open in your browser. Um, so this shows all the same information. The difference to Excel is uh, that now uh, your list here is, uh, and your chart are no longer interactive. You can look at it, but you can't uh, change it or filter it or do anything like that. And if you don't have R Markdown installed, but just plain R, it'll look like this. And uh, well, there's no way right now to see the tables, which is a little um, unfortunate. Um, I might change that in the future, and on, but uh, generally you should install our markdown if you want to go down the route using R. And um, now the other thing that I wanted to show you is the comparison between real and fake quotes. So on the top left, you see the strategy as was uh, simulated with real quotes purchased from the SIBO data shop. And on the bottom, you see uh, the same simulation run with fake quotes. And these fake quotes basically are calculated using black shows and based on SPX and VIX. And uh, then I'm adding a little bit of magic to create something like a volatility smile, which is not reflecting the real market conditions because there's no way for me to know, but at least something that is a little more realistic than assuming that it's just uh, flat. And this is a great way to learn coding and to get your feet wet and to see uh, what you can do there. It's similar enough to be useful. Uh, so for example, when you see these two uh, drawdowns in uh, uh, late 2015, early 2016, and see how they affect uh, the equity curve, where you also have these two drawdowns uh, in the blue line, we can see that uh, with the fake quotes, it's doing kind of the same thing. And the same is true for uh, the um, big uh, pullback in February 2018. So it it's, will still have the same characteristics, but um, don't fool yourself. This is different enough to be dangerous. So you should not be developing a strategy using this and then go into live trading without proper backtesting with real data. But it's a great way to get started for free without having to spend several hundred dollars for data first. Good, and I wanted to also show you the fully customizable reports. So this is uh, what I'm using for most of my stuff. So these are all uh, plots that I've created with Excel and my own custom templates. And I will um, create new templates for Touring Trader uh, as well and publish them. Uh, it just takes me some time to clean those up for, uh, for uh, general consumption. So these are pretty specialized to the stuff that I'm doing. Good. Um, now that we have that, uh, let's get to the last segment here, um, which is uh, how we can improve the strategy and can optimize a little bit. So how can we make this uh, better? So the first thing that we probably want to do is we want to scale the targets. Uh, so right now, the premium harvested and the premium for profit taken and for the stop loss are all just fixed numbers. And we want to make this adjustable. And then we want to check if we're actually really using the best values. So let's, let's see how we can do this. So um, the first thing that we want to do is we want to scale the dollar amounts. And uh, what we do here is we set ourselves a reference and I set it to 1300. And that is uh, totally arbitrary. Funny enough that uh, the a discussion with uh, Tim revealed that uh, an SPX of 1300 is pretty much uh, what it was when they designed this trade. And um, now we divide, define a little property here that gives us a scale. So basically we divide the underlying price by this reference and this gives us a number to scale everything with. And now let's have a look at open parking trade. So we had these all set to constant numbers 
And instead, what we do is uh, we define ourselves some variables so that we can influence the stuff and then we scale things. So basically the, the important part here is really is the SPX scale and uh, the open premium target. These are for now just constants and you can see that this is now not a dollar but a dollar 20 and I'll get to how I arrived at these values in just a minute. And um, Maybe you want to note here that there's these optimizer param attributes um, in front of uh, declaring the, um, the properties there. Uh, we get to the use of those in a minute as well. So don't worry about that. So let's do the same for the maintenance. So we had the profit target and the stop loss had to constant values. We do away with that. We define ourselves uh, some um, fields here and we scale them. Good. And now um, in the run method, we want to have a fitness value. So when we're optimizing, we need to know what we're optimizing for. And there's multiple things that we can optimize for. We can optimize for the net asset value. We can optimize for the uh, maximum drawdown. What I've chosen to do here is I, to do something like a poor man's version of the sharp ratio. So basically, I'm uh, dividing the percentage gained over the course of the simulation by the maximum drawdown. I use that as a simple fitness value. And we assign that at the end of the simulation. And now we can launch Turing Trader. So this, I guess, the first time we see that. Um, it's an ugly little tool, so the, the UI has nothing fancy and there's nothing really to speak about. What you see here now is a box showing a, a bunch of parameters. So these are all the parameters that had this optimizer param um, attribute in front of them. And now when we click on this optimize button, uh, this dialog is going to open. And what we can do here is we can select which values we want to optimize. And here I've chosen the open premium target and the maximum difference. And we can specify the start and end values and the step that we want to go through. And here at the bottom, it's going to show us how many iterations that's going to be. So in this case, it's 112 iterations. And when we hit the start button, or the optimize button, it will now uh, start iterating through these. And uh, this is a brute force iteration, and it will benefit from having many CPU cores. So when I do this kind of work, I typically do this on my i9 machine. And um, it requires a lot of RAM, so don't even try to do this with less than 8 gig. And it indicates the ETA, uh, how long it'll take to optimize this. And uh, just to give you an idea for how fast this might be, for a two-core i5, which is what my little laptop has, I can run about 530 iterations per hour. On i9, I can run about 2,600 iterations per hour, just to find the best combination of values. And um, when it's done, it's given you a report. And you can, uh, in this table, you can have the net asset value, and you have the maximum drawdown, and you have the fitness value. And what you can, you can sort by um, the, and you have the par, um, parameter settings, and you can sort by these values or any of these columns. And what you see here is, um, funny enough, uh, the maximum fitness value coincides with the maximum net asset value and the minimum drawdown. But that's not always the case. And now when you double click on a line like this, it will set these um, parameters. And before we had performance like this, and by just making things scalable and finding uh, better combinations of parameters, we can actually go to something like this. And this is actually something that's really, really useful because often you don't know when should I exit? Is a narrow stop loss going to be helpful or how much is that going to hurt my performance? And with the optimizer, you can find all these things. Good, so the improvements here that we made are higher and more consistent returns and a lower drawdown. A word of warning here, uh, there's a risk of overfitting and data snooping, so you need to have a little bit of an idea at least of what these two terms mean. So look those up and educate yourself a little bit so that you don't fool yourself with having a result that simulates great but uh, does poorly out of sampling and real trading. So <clears throat> now just uh, to conclude, let's have a look at uh, the Turing Trader summary real quick. There's some unique features about Turing Trader. So those are the cash transaction, the 
fact that it could simulate options at all, the integration of NORGATE and the customizable reports. When it comes to options, uh, we have calculation of Greeks, which is uh, not something that every uh, simulator, simulating options can do. We can we have the fake quotes, which are honestly great, not just for learning, but also for evaluating other characteristics of your um, strategies. We can calculate the PL line, <clears throat> and there's many more to come. So, Tour and Trader, excuse me. Tour and Trader is under rapid development, so I'm adding features pretty much every day. So, stay tuned, there's going to be more. And <clears throat> that brings me to the final thought. Is this a toy? Well, certainly not for me. And when we look back at my company, Bertram Solutions, I do all my research based on touring traders and I run all my model portfolios uh, on it. And I'm placing more than 3,000 trades a year uh, based on the stuff that Turing Trader puts out. So for me, this is actually very serious and open source does not mean that things are toy or not to be taken serious. Okay, so that's, that's about it. Um, thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, thanks Felix. Uh, there was only one question. Uh, is uh, data from STOOQ still available? Uh, it was last week. Okay, I guess that's a yes. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I think so. Uh, is there other information? Did somebody try and it's gone? Oh, I don't know. He, uh, I don't know if he's still here. Let me look. Uh, let he's me. still here. Yep. So, uh, is that a current question, or did you uh, look at STOOQ a long time ago, Dr. Frank? No, it's still there. Okay, so it's I'll still there. Have it on the screen right now. The, the problem is that the site is a Polish site, and uh, it, it might be a little difficult to, to get started. Um, so the recipe there is on the top left, there's a little box where you can type in a symbol, and once you hit enter, it turns to English. Okay. Um, no more questions, actually. So I guess you uh, kind of wowed them. So. Well, I'm sorry for that. That's okay. Uh, Tim, do you have any comments? Yeah, well, um, you know, I've, I've met Felix a couple times now, and uh, he's done a ton of work here, and uh, I think this all underscores the complexity of doing any kind of an automated, or any kind of a back test for that matter, uh, and the assumptions you make about um, the stop loss or the days to expiration when you open, uh, even small changes can make differences. And so it's a great tool for um, doing that what if kind of thing to see if you want to optimize a particular strategy. Uh, parking was a good example because it's a relatively simple uh, credit spread trade. And um, I think you showed a little bit of what if there at the end or what can be done to change or improve it. So it's complicated. I mean, uh, you know, we saw all the how to set this up and make it run in the beginning. Um, I think that merits some study if you want to use it, but uh, it's necessary to have a tool that's complicated if you want to be flexible and analyze uh, options trades in particular and uh, our strategies and rules that we use. Well, we do have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, Thomas says, why not use Excel instead? Uh, well, because with Excel, it's going to be really, really hard to set up all these rules. Uh, yes, you can. It's just going, it's going to take you much longer and it's going to be much less flexible. And uh, Dorian asks, is there a charge for Touring Trader? Uh, what, what kind of charge? What, what are you Charge, thinking? like fee, price. No, no, it's, 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 free. it's free as in beer and free as in open speech. Okay, that's good. And then uh, Dr. Frank asked, so what was the optimized value for uh, PTLT? Um, so the, um, the profit target is uh, at uh, 35 cents and uh, the stop loss is at $4.75, but uh, this is based on SPX of 1300 and linearly scaled up to today's SPX. 
And then Dorian says, if we do not want to do the programming, is there someone we can pay to do the programming for us? Uh, yes, this is uh, what I offer as part of the uh, R&D services. Ah, okay, there you go. And then Peter says, is the full parking trade example code available for download? Uh, I would love to make it uh, available for download. This is one of the questions that I haven't asked yet. So I guess I need to pass this question on to uh, Tim and uh, Dave Thomas, if uh, I'm allowed to publish that in the books and public, um, publication section of Turing Trader. Well, it's your call, Tim. Yeah, right. Um, Parking trade code. So I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the code in Turing Trader, or are you talking about the rules and the methodology of the parking trade? Rules and methodology of the parking trade. Um, you know, it's it's been discussed many times in webinars. Um, the information trading is all there about how we trade it. Trading groups. Yeah. 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 There's, I think, um, uh, some stuff on Aramir and some stuff on other places as well. So you're good with that? Did I make that publicly available or? Yeah, I think so because uh, you're talking about the rules here, which are not particularly. They're not highly classified. Yeah. Not highly classified, yeah. But you know, when we when we mentor this or when we um, have a you know sell a package or whatever, uh, there's there's some other things about how you can do it. You know. Um, okay. Good. So other uh, indicators, and you wouldn't be you wouldn't be showing that stuff. So that's fine. Then, then I would be doing the following. I would be um, putting it into the books and pub section of um, um, the True Trader project, and we'll publish that later today. Cool. Great. All right. Um, that looks like it for the questions. So uh, we're coming up right on an hour. So perfect timing. So thank you, Felix and Tim, for being on and a great presentation, Felix. Uh, nice work. Well, thank you so much for having me. That was fun. And sorry for this being um, just slides and less of a live presentation, but I thought about it, how to share my screen and show a live how the code looks like in Visual Studio and found that it's so difficult to highlight what's important, what to look at, and it's so distracting to see all the other things. That's why I went with uh, PowerPoint instead. Well, it's also dangerous to do things live because <laughs> it never goes the way you think it will. Um, so anyway, uh, Thank you very much. Um, I'll get this posted as soon as I can. And if people have questions, uh, what's the best way for them to contact you, Felix? Uh, well, there, there's tons of uh, links. Uh, well, generally, if you go on the Touring Trader site, there's a contact button somewhere, or an about button, and then there, there's my email there. So you can just email me. That's the easiest way, I guess. OK, perfect. All right. Well, thanks very much, everyone. And I will uh, end the meeting and get this posted and hope to have you back uh, in the future, Felix. I would love to come back, certainly. Thanks a lot for having me. All right. Thank we'll you. see everyone.